Hello there, everyone. Uh, Christian Barker here. Happy uh, Happy Friday, and uh, this is today's edition of Banter with Barker. Today we're going to be joined by um, the very uh, uh, the watchmaking marvel that is Max Busa, who has just joined us once again. This is our second time trying to join in. Let's hope it works. Okay, fingers crossed that Max will be hooking up with us now. Waiting on the connection. Thank you for joining us once again, Zena. No. All right, Max, hold on. Let me, um, I'm going to try once again inviting you. Let's see if that works. Ah, working. Miraculous. Okay, fantastic. Oh, I don't Every know. Every time I came in, kicked out, kicked out, kicked out. I was like, oh, this, this is weird. No good. I, I, where, where, whereabouts are you at the moment, Max? Are you in, are you in Geneva. Yes. Uh, in Dubai, it's always a bit of a mess because you need a VPN. Mm. And, uh, and in this case, um, it seems it was in Switzerland. A bit weird. Anyway, I'm all yours. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Well, it's uh, it's a great pleasure to be uh, to be speaking with you uh, as always. And for anyone who's uh, who's tuning in or watching this back on um, on the recording, um, Max and I have known one another for oh, it must be over a, over a decade or so now. But uh, Mr. Busser here is a uh, Italian-born Swiss gentleman um, with a very very long and distinguished background in the field of horology and uh, and watchmaking, an alumnus of uh, Gégé Le Cult, uh, Harry Winston, uh, where Max did some very innovative work for a number of years as the, uh, as the CEO, boss of Harry Winston. Um, and since, uh, what year was it, 2005, I think, that you launched uh, MBNF, um, which stands for Maximilian Busset and Friends, um, and is a, a collaborative effort, as the, uh, as the name suggests. And now you guys are up to uh, your 10th horological machine. Uh, the bulldog. Um, yeah, actually, eleventh. We're, 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 it's difficult to follow because it's HM10. There was right. an HMX in the middle, and uh, so it's actually the eleventh. Eleven um, HMs and seven LMs, so eighteen calibers in fifteen years. I sort of feel old when I say that. It's gone yeah. so far. No, and, you, and you've you've tricked us by having that that kind of one in between, in the same way that Apple has its. Uh, as its success and uh, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, now, the thing we, we want to talk about today and, and I guess focus on is that, uh, you know, you've chosen um, during this period to uh, to launch uh, e-commerce for your uh, for your timepieces. And I know you've had e-commerce from the Mad Gallery, the uh, um, Mechanical Art Devices Gallery, I believe right. that, that, if I'm correct. Um, so you've been selling all of those wonderful things, which I think we can see maybe a couple of them in the background. No, no that's actually my personal collection of weird <laughs> stuff. Okay, okay. Uh, but you have been selling um, various pieces of mechanical art um, out of your mad galleries in uh, in Hong Kong, Geneva, and, uh, and Dubai. And Taipei. And Taipei, and Taipei. Yeah. Um, for some time. But now you've chosen to uh, to finally make uh, make watches available. And you've got a very unique um model for the for the sales of, of the watches so i guess question number one would be why have you decided to uh begin selling your timepieces uh online and and number two if you could perhaps explain this uh this unique model that you've uh, that you've adopted and and why you've done it that way it um we, we well we had an e-commerce platform on the mad gallery for many years Mm. Um, just because actually we wanted to avoid friction. I think at some point as a brand, um, you, you want to give the experience to your, your customers, but you also have to make their life easier. Yeah. And we've done that. We, we never touched the watches. That was the grail that was like, I just don't want to upset our retail partners. Our, uh, our retail partners are 90% are of our business. 
Mm. And I just don't want them to feel that I'm competing with them. So typically when we did the CPO, the certified pre-owned pieces, we only chose watches, which are absolutely none of them would be at a retail store. Okay. So we're not in competition. And, uh, and so we, we didn't just, we just didn't want to do that. Uh, we, we are here thanks to our retail partners. Yeah, of and, course. Um, and then COVID happened. And suddenly mid-March, 24 out of our 26 retailers were closed. Mm. It was mm. amazing that they were actually continuing to sell, but they were closed. And, um, and then we started thinking, okay, maybe now is the time to, get, to afford our, our clients to be able to buy directly. But again, we did it with a twist. Um, two things happened. The first was the launch of the uh, collaboration with our friends from H. Moser. Mm. That was on, when was that? That was 4th of June. And um, 4th of June. And, um, and, and something I'll amazing happened. Say an absolute beauty, by the way. Um, Thank you. Uh, great stuff, great stuff. So what, what happened there is um, we, we had kept seven out of the uh, 60 pieces for our Mad Gallery in Geneva and the e-shop, if ever. And we really didn't expect anybody to go and put it in the basket and pay 49,000 Swiss francs and, and walk away. And um, we launched on at midday. By midnight, all seven pieces we had allocated for ourselves were actually sold. Not all put in basket, a few of them were, but a lot of people writing to us, I wanted, here's my credit card number, whatever. So, so those seven were gone in 12 hours. So the next morning on Thursday morning, we put waiting list. And then something incredible happened, even more incredible than what happened the day before. We got in 36 hours, 52 people who registered on the waiting list. Now, of course, we don't have any more allocation for ourselves. So what do we do? We start calling up our retailers. Have you sold your piece? Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. No, I haven't sold it yet. I mean, you just launched it yesterday, dude. What are you talking about? Well, I'm going to send you three clients. I'm going to send you two clients, three clients. And every single retailer who hadn't sold it in the first 24 to 48 hours got from us two to three people. Bottom line, in four days, all 60 pieces were catered to, paid, even though we hadn't delivered all of them, we delivered half of them. Right. And uh, there, that, that was a way of showing our retail partners that our eShop can be your best friend because we're actually mm. going to send you customers. Yep. The second thing we did, which was already in the thought when we were launching, was to say um, some of our retailers have ultra rare pieces where they're the only one or the last two in the world to have it, and we don't have any more. Mm. So we called them up and said, we're happy to feature that amazing piece. Would you be okay? And it's like, yeah, of course, sure. So the first one we started off with the, the last HM3 frog in titanium, uh, which is actually interesting. It's the 10th anniversary this year of frog. And the last one in the world is at West Time in Los Angeles. Sure. So we called the testimonial up and said, Greg, would you agree? Said, of course. So now we're, putting, we're telling the world, if you're looking for a, frog, a titanium frog, there is one. And it's at West Time. So if you click on it, we will actually put you in contact with West Time. Again, a second way of helping our retail partners. Precisely. We, no. we, we've already been doing that with our Instagram accounts, helping our retailers sell. Now we're doing it with the, uh, with the eShop. Um, I think during this COVID the whole situation, a lot of people or partners showed their true colors. Uh, uh, a lot of retailers amazed us, really supporting us. And I think we were, this was our way of saying you, you can always count on us. Well, so it's, it's a two-way highway. Mm. Amazing. Well, in incredibly successful. You, you, you've adopted the Supreme model and, uh, and everything's sold out before you've even got it. Now that's... Uh... <laughs> Go on, I, mean, uh, <laughs> I would love to say it happens often, but it was actually the very first time and uh, we would love it to happen. Uh, I, I won't lie in saying that we are, we have been thinking since last summer that it's something we have to do. We've always been producing less than what we thought the market would take, mm. but we gave time to the market. I mean, what we do is special. You need to try it on. You need to look at it. You can't just have a photo and say, oh, here, here's a hundred grand immediately. That doesn't, that doesn't seem right. 
But um, the Moser collaboration told us, well, actually people are okay with that. So um, you're going to see a launch we're going to do in October, uh, which is the second of our 15th anniversary pieces. The first was the collaboration with Moser. This is not a collaboration. And uh, we, will, um, we will basically um, to try to achieve the same sort of thing. So we're producing much, much less than what we should. Yeah. We're actually crafting the first year only 20 pieces. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and when it goes online, well, I hope everybody will be able to sell. And if they don't, we'll, we'll have that waiting list and we'll send them people. I mean, it's, it's, it's remarkable how far, um, you know, luxury e-commerce in, uh, in all of its areas has, has really come over the last, um, really just the last decade. You know, if, if, if you think back short space of time ago, um, you know, people were saying no one's going to spend five thousand dollars on on something online, and there was particular um, skepticism amongst watch companies. And I think you know, um, this period, I'm, I'm reading a lot of reports that uh, that many watch companies have, have really suffered because they had no um, e-commerce outlet, even for for far more. Uh, Guess, affordable, accessible pieces than, than, than you are making. And, uh, and, you know, the last three months, they've, they've really been hit because all of, their, all of their dealers have shut down, all of their own uh, retail outlets have shut down. And uh, there's just been nowhere to buy their stuff apart from on the, on the secondhand market. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing how, how things have kind of uh, have changed. But as you say, you know, your, your watches, are, they're, not, they're not a mere... Um, five thousand dollar purchase that that you can easily take a risk on that sort of thing. It's uh, it's you know it's a five or fifty or a hundred or two hundred. They're pieces which are very rare. Mm. So if you're, gonna, if you're gonna buy a Rolex, uh, a Patek, an RM, I feel like saying even though RM is very high end and very exclusive, they still do five thousand pieces a year, and everybody knows what an RM looks like. And in mm. that social environment, the clients a lot of their friends already have one. So they've already tried it on, etc. cetera. Yeah. We craft 200 pieces a year uh, and not 200 of the same piece yeah. of six different calibers. And you've got horological machines and legacy machines. And, and if we craft 15 to 20 of the same model a year, that's a lot. So yeah, except maybe in Singapore, where there is a, a big concentration of MDNF fans. Um, yeah. It's very difficult to see one on somebody's wrist. And therefore, mm. it's very difficult to just click, put in basket on something you've never tried on. Mm. But I, I just want to follow up on your thought. I think we, the watch industry, have been, um, have been very arrogant mm. in not offering a, um, an e-commerce. While we thought we were actually caring for the customer and not doing something as vulgar as an e-shop, um, we were actually being arrogant because we were making a customer's life difficult. Yeah. Now, if I'm living in Ohio mm. and I want to buy, I don't know, even a, 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 a watch which is pretty much well known, uh, maybe I don't have a lot of choice. So what do I have to do? I have to go and take a plane, go to yep. a big city wherever. Uh, then I have to take a hotel. Then I have to take a cab to get to the store and be there at 10 o'clock, not at 9. No, 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 you can't come at 9. You have to come at 10. And yep. then we arrive at 10. There is a big probability um, that um, you actually know more then the person is actually going to sell it to you. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, and so basically you're making me do all of this to get a coffee and a chocolate because that's the sales experience. And yeah. you're like, you know what? I just want to be at home in front of my iPad and my computer and say, I know what I want. Yeah. Just deliver it to me. Stop mm. being so stuck up. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so, um, and I think we've, I think, I think we've been wrong. I think uh, it is our obligation, as I was saying, to take the friction out of the system and to allow anybody who wants a piece to buy it whenever they want. Mm. Do I expect a lot of people to go online and buy a piece from us? No. 
but I have to offer that option. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, times, times have changed. Although, you know, I was speaking with, with Suzanne Wong on one of these things uh, about, a, about a week ago, and she was at the, um, at the uh, Geneva uh, watch auction um, where someone's just been commenting that, that your bits uh, did, did quite well there, so bravo. Um, but, you know, she... I she had a piece uh, going on, on sale. I was like, oh, my God, I just saw that. I was yeah. like, okay, I have to check that out as soon as this is, this is finished. Indeed, indeed. Um, but yeah, no, Suzanne kind of, uh, I, I think we were talking about e-commerce and the fact that the industry has, has suffered the last few months because, I mean, this is an unprecedented situation. No one could have expected that all the shops basically of all kinds around the world would be, uh, would be shut for a three to, to six month period. Um, but, you know, if you, if you look at the auction market people have been bidding down the phone sight unseen on hugely expensive things whether that's a work of art whether that's uh, a timepiece whether that's a vase motorcycle car whatever it may be and you know we've had for for years decades people around the world seeing something in a in a brochure going i like that um calling up bidding and perhaps laying down millions of dollars for it um you know it's not it's not unheard of is it I bought three watches during the lockdown. <laughs> uh, not immensely expensive watches. My first one was my first G-Shock, so clearly not expensive. But um, I also bought a 1968 uh, Omega Chronostop, which was really cool. And yeah. I bought the 1972 Zenith um, Future Time Command, which is probably one of the coolest 70s watches, which is completely under the radar. And um, and so, yes, I was at my, in front of my computer and I was buying. Um, yeah. Why not? Because that's in my price league. I mean, somebody who's got way more wealth than me, why could he or she buy a 50,000, 100,000 US dollar watch? Why mm. not? Yeah. Again, why? What, and I'll come back to what you're saying. A lot of our retail partners, while they were closed, were actually selling. It's interesting because there were those who just closed shop finished, halas, goodbye, see you in a couple of months. And there were those who closed and continued calling us up, I need this, I need that. I'm like, what? When we sent our team back home on the 17th of March, finished, it's closed, the lockdown, I thought it was finished. Well, suddenly we could start getting orders coming in. I, I need this, I need that. I'm like, really? Yeah, I sold it. I mean, but you're closed. I don't need to be open to sell. Uh -huh. and, um, and, so, and so slowly, slowly, we brought our watchmakers back in little groups. Uh, that was in March and April and started assembling movements again. And it was interesting to see that the retailers who did very well during this lockdown were retail partners who actually have real relationships. Mm. Yeah. Well, those who were waiting for the tourists to come in or because they've got really great brands or whoever XYZ Lambda was going to come in, they was more difficult for them. No. And you saw actually what was interesting is that you may not need that physical presence that much and pay that insane rent. Now I'm starting to think, wow, this is interesting. And I almost remember I was talking with, um, actually with the, uh, the managers of the Hourglass uh, a year back, because every time I came to see them, they were all the time on their phone. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, they're like, what are you doing, dude? I'm, I'm, I'm selling watches. And, yeah. and, uh, and so I asked them, and this was last year, <clears throat> what percentage of, uh, of timepieces do you actually sell to somebody walking into the store compared to on your phone? Mm. And do you know what they answered? They all told me 70 to 80 percent is done on this phone. Mm. Amazing. So I'm not saying that brick and mortar is not necessary, mm. but I'm saying that we need a seamless concept and it's okay to do e-commerce and it's okay to sell on Instagram and it's okay to sell on WhatsApp. Um, I saw in Dubai a business which opened, I didn't even know it existed, WhatsApp business. WhatsApp has got a WhatsApp business line. So in, typically in, in, um, in Dubai, if you want to buy Aesop, you know, the Australian uh, cosmetics brand, uh, as all the doors were closed, you didn't, there was, of course, the eShop, but there was, you could actually send a WhatsApp to a number and they would start talking to you and then they would send you a link to pay, like a PayPal link, by WhatsApp. Yep. 
And why not? Of course, we're talking of a $50 thing, but why not offer that? Who are we to say we're going to make your life difficult? Indeed, indeed. Now, look, well, my life is being made difficult because someone has, uh, has chosen to buy the house that I live in, sight unseen, during the COVID crisis. They, they, they never even walked through the place, but... Uh, and that was a that was a that was a big purchase. That was a you know several million dollar purchase here in Singapore. You want to get a garage for a million bucks in this town. Um, so you know that it, these kind of examples really do go to show that, uh, that yeah we're in a in a new world, right? Just make it. Easy. It's going to accelerate with what happened. Hmm. Um, I was hearing numbers here in Switzerland yesterday on the news that. Uh, $2 billion of merchandise have been transacted over the, the whatever last two months in, uh, in Switzerland. And it seemed to be a very big amount. So I have no idea if it's, it's uh, it didn't unfortunately give us a percentage, but they were saying this is an enormous increase of transactions in Switzerland on, on the net. Mm. And will people go back to stores? Well, of course they'll go back to stores if they have a reason to go back to stores. Yeah. It's, called, it's very Darwinian. Yeah. <laughs> If you don't bring a reason, then people are not going to come. If the only reason is because you've got the inventory and the inventory is online, well, you're in danger. Yeah. So what is the reason? The reason has to be, of course, that famous experience. But more than that, it has to be a person has to come into your store because they like going there because they feel welcome, because they get, they get engaged and inspired and, and somebody makes them think different and shows them something different. And not only I have the same stuff as everybody else. And it's, a, it's basically, I'm not gonna give you any information and just, oh, you're lucky because I've got the stock. Yeah. That's gonna, that, I don't think that's gonna fly anymore. Was it a learning curve for you when you, when you decided to become a, um a retailer, uh, become a shopkeeper, as it were. And I've got to say, you know, the Mad Gallery in, in Geneva, um, I think every time I've visited Geneva, I have paid a visit to you there because it's just such a, such a fun experience. Um, and there's always something new. Um, but, what, you know, was that, was that kind of a learning curve for you? And, and, and if so, what would you say were the, the, main, um, the main lessons that you've learned over your, uh, over your time opening all four of those, those stores and maintaining those stores? Well, um, first thing is I got way more empathy for my retail partners. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, you know, 30 years ago in the watch industry, it was very, it was a, it was, it was a two, it was a two totally different universe. There was a brand mm. doing the R&D and the engineering and the production and crafting the piece. And then the brand would give it to the retailer who would do the sales. It was completely different. Virtually no brand 30 years ago had a boutique. And so at Jaeger Le Coultre, um, when I started, it was, no, that was it. So we had mm -hmm. no idea. And we were, they were always, both of us, the retailers and the brands were bitching that, oh, he doesn't understand what I'm trying to do. And the retailer would say, he's not understanding the difficulty of my life. And uh, so I have very little experience in retailing. Harry Winston, we had a few boutiques, but they didn't want to sell the watches anyway. So, right. so I had an issue with my own boutiques didn't want to actually sell my, my product um, because we are a jewelry brand. And, um, and so uh, when I started MBNF, I, I couldn't have done this without my retail partners. And of course you, but you still say, oh, I would have done it that way. I would have done it this way. And so when I opened the Mad Gallery, I really infused in it the whole treat people the way you want to be treated. I wanted to give them that experience that I would have liked to have in a store. And that's what we've done. And then you realize that customers are not always easy <laughs> because we have a very romantic uh, perception that um, customers are exactly like us, the creators. Right. Yeah. And, the, and the retail partners, they just don't get it. You know, you've got, the, you've got the customer who's passionate and the brand who's passionate and the middle of the retailer, he's not giving the passion. Well, all customers are not passionate. All customers are not easy. Um, 
and you realize that um, yes, we did, we do our best, but it's not easy because a lot of people may take advantage of you. They 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 lead you on. They make you believe stuff, and um, and then you realize that ah, oh, it's not that easy. And so I've got much more empathy and much more respect for my retail partners even than before. And that's what I'm telling you. Even when I did the e-shop, I wanted to be there to support them. And, um, and so, yes, I, um, I, I, I do realize what you will get in a mad gallery is, is a, at least in Geneva, because the other three are franchises. And even though we work closely with them, it's not us. Mm -hmm. um, you, you get in Geneva, uh, I think you get a great welcome. You get somebody, um, typically in, in, in Geneva, nobody's on commission. Mm. Yeah. Economically, it makes no sense. I'll tell you honestly. Okay. A salesperson needs to be put on commission. It, it's very important. But I don't do that. I don't do that because I'm saying, this. you're coming to my house. Mm. I'm not here to tell you something. I want you to enjoy the experience. And if you buy something, it's okay. But I can do that because I've got the revenue of MBNF. Yeah. And I just don't depend on if I just had that mad Gary. Yeah, of course I have to sell stuff. And yeah. so when you come and everybody's telling me that, you've been so laid back in the Geneva mad Gary. We don't feel any pressure to buy anything. And, and people come in just saying, oh, we're just coming in to have a look. We'll stay half an hour and an hour. And we love that. Yeah. But if you're speaking for half an hour, an hour to somebody and three other people are coming in and you don't have the time to cater to them, well, yeah. you're not doing a good business decision. But that's how we decided because there's nothing worse than when you're talking to a salesperson suddenly goes, uh, sorry, leaves you there in the middle of a phrase and goes to cater to somebody else. That's so like we have to do that. But again, we have got this incredible luxury is that it's not what, make, it's not, sorry, it's not what makes us live. It's, 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 our, it's our way of, uh, of just welcoming people and telling them the story. And, and if they buy something, we're happy. But that's not the point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, well, and, and you're, you're fortunate that you've got, uh, as you were saying, um, collectors who, who love what you do to the extent that they are, they've, they've still been um, buying your timepieces while everything's been shut down. And I think, you know, that's, that's certainly not the case right across, uh, right across the board. Um, I, don't, I don't know, how, how, do you, how do you think this, this whole situation is, is going to affect consumption, I guess, of, of you know, um, of, of more exclusive or, or luxurious goods? It's funny, I've, I've been hearing, I keep using this example, I've been hearing from wine distributors here in Singapore that the super, super top end, like, you know, your Cheval Blancs and whatever, people are consuming less of that, but they are buying more of the, of the you know, good stuff that's a couple of hundred bucks or whatever. Um, and perhaps that's because they're not putting on a display where they're out sitting in a, in a restaurant or they're, or they're not having people over and, and needing to impress people with, with sort of status symbol, um, symbol goods. But then I read, I read an article from a newspaper in Australia this morning that said people are actually buying more expensive wines because at home they want to pamper that, you know, I suppose they're, they're not going out to restaurants and they're not spending their money the, any other way. So they're thinking, stuff it, I'll get, you know, I'll get the, the $200 bottle of wine when I would normally drink the, the $50 uh, bottle of wine. I, I don't know, how, how do you see this whole situation that we're currently facing and, and where it's going, um, you know, affecting the business that you're in and that other uh, loosely luxury good providers are, uh, are in? Mm. It's a good point. Um, again, I, I, I have no idea. I can only tell you what's happened to us. Mm. Um, in March, when I had to send back my whole team to home because of confinement, I thought it was the end of the world. And I'd slashed by practically 50% our objective of the year. And, you know, every year since 2013, we've been doing the same revenue. We don't want to grow. And I told everybody 50% off. And we'll be lucky if we hit that. But we cut everything. And then sales continued. And, conti and, they, and they actually grew. <laughs> and at the end of June, we have had our 
the highest sellout of first semester in history. Hmm. And of, of the 15 years, we've never had such a strong sellout. The sellout of the first six months of this year is already 70% of the whole of last year, which was a great year. Hmm. And we're like, what, how is this even possible? And A, we didn't expect it. B, we actually don't realize why. So there are probably all multiple reasons to it. Maybe it's 15 years of great work, which is suddenly happening. But I don't think it's only that. I, I, I think that um, we've consistently been talking to people about, um, this, I'll put it this way. Our customers, most of our customers are buying our products for themselves. Mm. We're not a status or status uh, brand. And, um, and so our customers are very much, I love this piece. I love this story. Um, I, I am in, most of us talk to us. I, I spend so much time on, on WhatsApp, Instagram messages, Facebook messages, emails with customers. And we're, they've become friends. We're, we're in dialogue all the time, not talking only about watches, by the way. And, um, and so we've always been that way. And I think what happened during this whole lockdown, confinement, COVID era, is when you have nobody to impress, what's the point of buying something to impress? Mm. But when you're stuck one month, two months, three months at home with yourself, it's become about yourself. Mm. And, uh, and then suddenly, um, and because we were always in contact, these IG lives have been incredible. Three months ago, I didn't even know what an IG live was. And, and we started doing all these IG lives and people interacting with us and us answering questions, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and so I think, I, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but because we're a brand about you and not mm. about the others, we, we, that also was an element. And if you're a brand just to show off, if you've got nobody to show off to, well, of course, you're, you're not going to probably buy that. But look, human beings are incredibly resilient and they forget and they go back into their old ways. And as soon as the world will open up, and it has, I mean, I'm, I'm in Switzerland, I'm, I'm shocked. I came from Dubai, where everything is still very, very, uh, I mean, it's very um, measured, and everybody's wearing masks, and you can't do this, mm. you can't do that. And I arrived at Zurich Airport, and it was as if life hadn't gone, Switzerland hadn't gone through COVID. Everybody, everything is back to normal as before. Yeah. So if that happens, what happened before will happen again after. Um, I, I don't think, I don't think people will change that much. Uh, maybe some will, and, uh, but I, I don't count on it. You're, you're, you're right that you're, you know, you're very fortunate that you're in, uh, um, uh, that what you create is, um, is such a joyous product. And, 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 and as you say, you know, something that, um, that isn't, I, I, I'm constantly quoting um, something you said to me ages ago, uh, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, back to people in where I, I think we were talking about the Aquapod. And I said, why make a diver's watch that you can't or you probably shouldn't go diving in? And you said, because a watch is an object for telling time, that's objective or its function is not to tell time and that it has all of these other um, all these other functions to it, and I love that quote. And and it's, I mean, it's true um, that yeah, what 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 you create is something that that gives people joy, and that is a um, a joy that they feel themselves, rather than to try to outwardly express their wealth or their status or, or whatever it may be. Absolutely, and that that is something which is very very strongly ingrained in us. And mm. it's interesting because when we create a product. We are not interested at all, and I'll say we, but actually it's I in this case, in uh, actually the market or what people like or want, because we would never create what we've created if we we're always looking at what do people want. People yeah. don't want a 52 millimeter diving watch you can't dive with. <laughs> people don't want a robot which gives time. People yeah. don't want a watch which looks like a spaceship. Nobody, I mean, there's no market study to tell you that there's any market from that. Um, but we do it because we love it and because, and that, that's, that's my definition of art, is we create it for ourselves. 
Then afterwards, luckily there's the internet and social media and all that, which allows us to interact with people to tell them our story. But we never actually create something thinking, oh yes, they will like that. <laughs> never, never at all. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, well, I, think it, I think it's the same thing as at the moment, um, you know, BMW is probably struggling to sell a five series and, and you know, uh, your more sort of quotidian everyday Mercedes or, or you know, whatever sedan, um, a lot of those will be sitting on the lot. But the moment a beautiful, um, you know, lime green Lamborghini Miura comes onto the market, which is not going to be someone's everyday car and they're not going to buy it to drive to and from work, which they, they probably don't, if they're like me, that, you know, they're not leaving their house and they're not, not commuting at the moment, but they will buy it because it's a joy and it's something that's going to give them immense pleasure. And it's probably not their only car. You know, they've probably got something that satisfies the simple need. And, and if you take that back to watches, you know, we've got so many things that, as you say, tell us the time, we don't need it for telling the time. And if I want to time the amount of time it's going to take me to cook some pasta, I'll say Siri, time 11 minutes. She's probably going to do that now. Stop. Don't do that, Siri. Um, but yeah, you know. It's, That's, it's exactly it. That's exactly it. Um, I, th I think there's, there's, there's probably two reasons why people would buy high-end mechanical watches. As I said, one is for them because they love them, because they uh, they don't have you don't have to be incredibly educated in watchmaking to love a beautiful timepiece. That's also something which I think is a is sort of assumed that you have to be on all the watch blogs and know the difference between a, a Breguet curve or not on your on your spiral. You don't need that. It's great if you do because yeah. then I'm happy to have that discussion with uh, with people. And I've got a lot of clients who are total watch geeks, and I love watch geeks because they're like me and. And sort of my wife goes like, oh, my God, he's met a watch geek. And that's my, my, my evening is screwed. Because <laughs> there I am talking about watches. But you don't need that to appreciate a beautiful timepiece. So, but that's for you. And then there's a whole other lot of people who is, look, I am successful. I am rich. I am this. I am that. And that's fine also. It's not my cup of tea. But... That is completely okay because at the end of the day, you're helping incredible engineers, incredible artisans, and incredible watchmakers to create something beautiful. So whatever the reason, just go out and, and, and enjoy. Do, do, going back to the, the thing, artisans, and, and you were talking a moment ago about when your business was, uh, was shut down. Um, when I've been speaking with you know, tailors, shoemakers, whatever, that they've kind of said to me, uh, and, and I'm talking at the, at the kind of bespoke ends, um, where, you know, some of these guys, you order something and three years later, it might be delivered to, to you because they've got a serious backlog. And they've been saying, look, it's been kind of good because we've managed to, to kind of catch up on our orders. And we're nearly, you know, there's only going to be a 12 month waiting period from now on. Um, has it been at all like that with, with your, um, with your crafts people? Um, you know, I, I suppose that was the way that the Swiss watch industry began was all of those people beavering away in their, in their chalets in the middle of, uh, of winter, but is it possible to do any of this work from home or is it now, you know, much too, uh, um, involving back to normal has been back to normal since, um, officially 15th of May. Mm. But actually way before that already, uh, we, we didn't even lock down here. I mean, they didn't because I wasn't here. I would have liked to be here, <laughs> but uh, um, they, they didn't actually lock down. I mean, all my friends tell me the lockdown was the best moment of their life. You could go out and do, take your bicycle and go do sports and do whatever. And it was beautiful weather during that lockdown. And since I've been here for a week, everybody's telling me, oh, this was so great. Plus, we've got an extraordinary government which um, on the, the, the day that they said it's a pandemia, you've got an issue, they, they basically insured the salary of 80% of the salary of every single person in the country who lost their, or who was not able to work. And, um, and they gave incredible credit lines at zero interest to companies. I mean, what happened here, kudos to Swiss government was incredible. The only issue is, talking to people around here, and I'm sorry I'm digressing, but it's something which really is on my mind, is everybody had the impression this is free money. 
Mm. When I was working in Singapore, it's like, oh, great, I'm paid to stay at home and spend time with my family and go out. And, and my, some friends were like, I was on my bicycle every day. It was so cool. And I was like, yeah, um, somebody's going to have to pay for this, guys. Yeah. We're talking 60 billion Swiss francs, I think the government dished out. Mm. Um, who's going to pay for this? Your taxes are going to have to go up. What if something's going to, I mean, we have been printing like everybody else printing money, but mm. this, I, I thought it's very annoying that most people who've had help from the government uh, of like, oh, it's normal. I'm like, well, no, it's not normal. There's going to be a price to this. Yeah. So enjoy it. Be grateful. But there is going to be a price to this. Well, yeah, the government in Singapore is, is yet to dish some money out to me. So hopefully there will not be a price to pay, uh, a price to pay here. But look, you're absolutely right. And, and, and maybe that's, a, that's a, the same issue that we have with, uh, with the environment as well, that people uh, think that they can keep doing whatever they, uh, whatever they like and uh, expending resources and, and using stuff up as much as they like and no one will have any... Uh, have to pay any price, which is kind of true if you're 80 years of age, that no, you probably won't have to pay the price, but our kids will, our grandchildren will. So uh, yeah, we all need to be uh, a bit more thoughtful about that. And, spe and look, speaking of which, what are you into in, uh, in motoring these days, burning up those, uh, those carbon fuels and, uh, um, and, uh, and destroying our environment with some beautiful cars? What, what are you tooling around in these days? Last time we spoke, it was a, it was a Stingray, I think. Yeah, well, I, I don't drive it much. That, uh, that exactly, I bought that Stingray, it's a 1965 Stingray. Um, interestingly enough, not actually to drive it, even though it is fun to drive, but in a, in a way of driving a, a classic car, because somebody who hasn't driven a classic car is, again, you've got a romantic idea of what it is, and then you've actually got the fact of driving it. Um, okay. and, um, and I always remember that I'm digressing again. I always wanted to buy an Austin Healy frog eye. I love frog eyes. I think they're so cool. I mean, the, the idea of them, the design of them, this little frog eye uh, look. And one day, um, the, 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 guy, the famous garage I bought the, the Stingray from, I was telling him about that. He said, hmm? have you driven one? I said, no. I said, he said, come here. This is one of my clients. I'll just take you around. You can drive it for a few miles. Okay. <laughs> drove it for a few miles. They give it back to him as I'm never going to buy this car. It, it was so scary, so incredibly scary. First of all, of course, you don't have seat belts. It's yeah. made of it. So you're you're driving around, and because the, you don't have a boot either, when you when you um, when you brake, the the, uh, the seats go <laughs> like this. And so what happens is that when you're braking, your whole seat goes like this, and and you've got 17 horsepower. And so when you start accelerating to get onto the road and you've got these cars speeding ahead, nothing happens. There's a lot of noise and, and nothing happens. And you see these 40 ton lorries arriving and you're like, fuck. <laughs> and, you're, and you're like, okay, I love the idea, yeah. but I don't think I'm gonna drive it. So the Stingray was a bit of that. So I'm not polluting the environment because I think I drive it like twice a year if everything goes well. But I love the idea that somebody created this incredible piece at that era. I love to look at it. It's so, from every single angle, if you're a creator, a designer, and you look at that piece, you can not like it, but you have to admire the person who, who designed it. And um, it comes back to an era where engineers were artists. Yeah. There were no finance people to tell them what they could or not do. There were no, um, there were no marketing people to tell them, oh my gosh, this, there is no market for this. So we all have to make the same car as everybody else. And, um, and so and I, I'm talking of a Stingray because that's what I could afford. I mean, there are things I lost on which I, I definitely cannot afford. Uh, and, um, and so, yeah, typically, um, so my... my one of my, my real car, which I, I was actually driving yesterday, I don't actually speak about it, but as Michael T put my car in the hourglass film, I'm going to talk about it. It's yeah. my Wiesman MF4S. Um, I used to drive, uh, in my Harry Winston days, I had a TBR. Yeah. And, uh, and a TBR, for anybody who's a petrol head, knows that 
it's an insanely dangerous car. It's, you, you're supposedly repairing it all the time. But mine never had, for nine years, I never had to repair it. But it is an incredibly dangerous car. And, um, and when I sold it, because they'd gone bankrupt, and I thought, mm, if I need any components here, I'm, I'm, it's going to be really com uh, complicated. And I bought myself a Visma. And then they went bankrupt because every single car brand I buy of these small artisan brands, it's not sustainable. Mm. Uh, but it's coming back to it. It's so beautiful. Uh, I brought it to, the, to a service it and the guys were in this hyper car garage and every mechanic was around it going, wow, this, no. this is worth a fraction of the price of all the cars which were there. And they're like, it's so beautiful. And uh, because it was made by two brothers, the Wiesman brothers, who wanted to create what was the most beautiful for them. It drove them to bankruptcy because when I visited their, their workshops, I was with my technical director, who was an incredible petrol head and who drives vintage cars. After an hour, he looked at me, he said, they're going to go bankrupt. I'm like, what? He said, this brand is going to go bankrupt. Right. Said, what are you paying that? He said, look, Aluminium monoblock racing car chassis made one after the other. They make their own body work. They've had the molds themselves. No. Every single electrical board for Mr. Schmidt or Mr. Uh, Mr. Busser or Mr. Whatever was specifically made for each car. So no. you would go into the workshops and you had every single Mr. His car was this thing. He's like, there is no way they can sell this for the price of a Porsche. There is no way. They, they, they must be hemorrhaging cash on every car they're, they're making. And, and yeah, well, three years later, two years later, they went bankrupt. But okay. I've got an incredible piece of art, and they used to make yeah. 150 of them. Yeah, and, and I'm sure they had great fun while they were, uh, while they were doing it. Um, and as you say, you have a, you have a lovely relic of their... Uh, of their uh, um, flight of passion so uh, so there we are um we're kind of we're running out of time and the last thing still on on the matter of of, of cars I, I was like talking about um your automotive design inspirations with you uh, and it strikes me that when we have spoken about that before you've you've kind of expressed a love for a lot of very angular um angular automobiles like like you know the the old 80s lotus and uh, you know the original um, Volkswagen Golf and so forth, which are very kind of jagged, straight lines, um, which we haven't seen terribly much of in in any of your uh, any of your creations, which are always quite sort of voluptuous and curvaceous and and more organic, uh, for want of a better word, um, sort of shape. So do you ever? Yeah, someone's just said wedge tastic. Do you ever? Um, Imagine that you're going to do something, uh, you know, that, that's got those kind of sharp sort of lines to it. Uh, does that interest you? I'll put it this way. And if you see my Wiesmann, you can't have more voluptuous than that. If you look at a Stingray 65, 60, it's the same thing. I love voluptuous. Mm -hmm. Why I actually love the wedge design of, I mean, of Jujaro's Golf or... Uh, yeah. Of the Esprit, the original, etc., is because I grew up with it, mm. and that's very interesting. And I'll be interviewing um, Simon Kidston on IG Live on Monday uh, here in Geneva, who's one of the the greatest. How would I say? Uh, he's a curator of of high end uh, classic cars, and we were talking with him and. Most of the reasons why classic car collectors buy these classic cars is linked to their childhood. Mm. It was either yep. because it was the car that their dad had, and now they've grown up and they've made their mail, they want to buy that, that mirror that he had, yep. or it's because as a kid, they had no money at all, but they were playing with that mirror dinky toy. Yeah, and, and, and so that's, that's for me, and I don't have the Mura, I will probably never be able to afford the Mura. Uh, yeah. but, but that pistachio dinky toy Mura I used to play with, hence it comes back to me. But when I was growing up, when I was 18, and I had my little 50 horsepower Opel Corsa, which was a terrible car, oh. and my wealthy friends 
had a Golf GTI 1.8 trophy, uh-huh. emerald green, metalized green. And I was like, oh my God, that car. And when, when this friend would actually allow me to, to drive it, it was like, wow, with the, with the, with the Golf uh, ball, uh, gear stick and etc. So again, this is unfortunately 35 years ago. Um, I want that car. Yeah. I'm 53. I want that trophy 1.8 golf. It doesn't make yeah. any sense. Yeah. Like yesterday I was debating because somebody offered me a, a, a Renault 5 Turbo, which I've been losting over for years. Yes. You know, yeah. the, the little Renault 5, which was crazy with the rally yeah. car where they put the engine at the back. Yeah. It was a 1.4 liter engine with 160 horsepower, but it was lethal. Lethal because it's like a TBR. It's impossible to drive. Um, but when I was growing up, that R5 Turbo with Jean Ragnotti driving uh, in Monte Carlo was what made me happy. I was like, well, so now I want it. Any normal human being would look at me and go, are you freaking crazy? Why the hell would you buy that, that car? But it was what I was growing up with. Yeah. Oh. Well, I think um, Instagram is going to cut us off. My dog seems to be going mad as well. So I was requesting to see the dog, but I don't think I can control her, um, little Beatrix. But, uh, but Max, it's been a great pleasure chatting with you, uh, as always. Just as we're finishing, if anyone who's listening has any questions for Mr. Brousseau or for myself that either of us can answer. I saw a good question. I saw a good question. Am I going to create a more affordable piece? Oh, okay. It's been my goal for 15 years. I mean, God, when I created MBNF, I'd already created a second brand, which was going to be more affordable. I I couldn't find the means to launch it. Three years ago, I was going to launch a second brand, which is going to be more affordable. And I realized I, between MBNF and my family, I already don't have enough time for both of them. So how am I going to do this? I'm still working on it. Give me some time. It probably won't be a brand. I don't know, but I have ideas to make cool products at, I'm not saying $250, but let's say $2,500. No. I'm still working on it. Um, maybe it'll never come out, but one day I hope it does. Well, when you do, sign me up. Um, I'm there. I'm there. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll let someone else um, uh, buy all of your remaining stock of the, uh, of the HM10. Um, but it sounds like you don't need terribly much help. But, uh, but look, Max, it's been a great, great pleasure. It's always a, always a good fun um, and a pleasure chatting with you. And I, I look forward to, in not too long, you know, um, having a refreshing beverage with you uh, somewhere. This is only water, I should say. Yeah, it's a very cool cup. Very cool mug you've got there. So there you go. Cheers to everybody. Great talking. Thanks, Christian. Speak to you guys very soon. A yep. bientôt. Thanks to everyone Cheers. who joined us today. Looking forward to you next time on Banter with Bucker. Ciao. See you, Max. Take care. Thank you.